Hello there everyone, welcome to the channel if you're new, welcome back if you aren't, I'm EDJ. We are now in the third part of the history of Russia, the Age of Glory. So I'm really looking forward to learning about Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great is an individual who I've heard a lot about, you know, um, like I said, I, I'm, I'm, I've heard things about her, but like a long time ago, so like a lot of my knowledge is basically gone. <laughs> Whatever I did know about her, obviously one of the most famous rulers of just all time and you know obviously being a woman adds um to that because there are and the, the ratio between male and female rulers in history is obviously you know you know <laughs> but um i'm really looking forward to just seeing and learning more about her because like obviously you don't get the name the great by doing nothing and i'm just you know like i said i, I was really it was really interesting to learn about just how many, like, female rulers Russia had. And I'm like, I think that's something I found really fascinating about part two. And so I'm really looking forward to just seeing a little bit more about Catherine and, you know, what made her so great, right? Um, and obviously there's gonna be much more to it, just the age of glory, right, of, of Russia. So I'm really looking forward to just learning more about it. And yeah, without any further ado, let's get to it. Let's watch The History of Russia Part 3, The Age of Glory. In the early 1700s, Peter the Great's reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become Empress of Russia, who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment and even corresponded with the French philosopher Voltaire. She mm. reigned as an enlightened autocrat. Her power was unchecked, but she pursued ideals of reason, tolerance and progress. Catherine became a great patron of the arts and learning. Schools and colleges were built. The Bolshoi Theatre was founded, as well as the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts while her own magnificent collection of artwork now forms the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. Wow. Catherine encouraged Europeans to move to Russia to share their expertise and helped German migrants to settle in the Volga region, where they became known as Volga Germans. Their communities survived nearly 200 years until, on Stalin's orders, they were deported east at the start of World War II. Catherine's reign also saw enormous... I think that's something that I remember from Epic, not Epic, but Oversimplify when he was covering some of Russia, that Russia, you know, is actually very culturally rich, and obviously there are different, like, yeah, it's one, you know, one country, but, like, there's a lot of, like, richness and there were differences. I'm not sure about nowadays, especially after, you know, everything that's happened. Like I said, I'm, I'm ignorant of nowadays, but, um, of what's going on in the world, or at least, you know, in Europe. But, yeah, that there were, like, you know, different groups and whatnot. And, yeah, you know, there's just, like, diversity in ethnicity and you know, some, like, there are different places. Again, that was from the epic history covering up, leading up to the Russian Revolution. I'm not sure about nowadays, but, um, yeah, there, there was, you know, differences. And obviously there's, like, a Germ a German group here in Russia, right? So, obviously, yeah, that there, I don't know. I don't know, I think that's something interesting that I remembered territorial expansion. In the south, Russia defeated the Ottoman Empire, winning new lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. 
But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt, led by the renegade Cossack Yemelian Pugachev. The rebels took many fortresses and towns, and stormed the city of Kazan, before they were finally defeated by the Russian army. Catherine then forcibly incorporated the Zaporozhian Cossacks into the Russian Empire, and annexed the Crimean Khanate, a thorn in Russia's side for 300 years. Yeah, like I was always like, huh, it's, it's weird they just left it alone. I, I was kind of thinking about that last video, though obviously with all of this. Yeah, I agree with that. that that's cool. <laughs> Good move right there, right? Just absorb that. Also, I really like, like I said, I mentioned during the Napoleonic series, or, you know, I noticed that, you know, Russia was beefing with the Ottomans even to that point. And I think even some of the treaties that Tsar Alexander and Napoleon talked about, Napoleon kind of gave an illusion that he would help Russia against the Ottomans. So obviously th this battle between the two raged for quite a bit. And, um... Yeah, like I said, it's something really interesting, though there's not a lot of videos on YouTube covering the battles between these two, but it's something that I, I have been interested in and, you know, been wanting to research on my own. Russia's new lands in the south were named Nova Russia, New Russia. Sparsely populated, they were settled by Russian colonists under the supervision of Prince Potemkin, Catherine's advisor and lover. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, exhausted by war and at the mercy of its neighbours, was carved up in a series of partitions, with Russia taking the lion's share. Poland did not... Yep, Poland, as we know, like, during the Napoleonic era, right, Poland is far from, it's not even a nation anymore, it just gets absorbed by everyone else, <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it will remain like that until the end of World War One, essentially, so, yeah, that, that's really interesting, right, how it was once such a threat, right, a, a force of its own. And then just, yeah, just basically got absorbed. Not re-emerge as an independent nation until 1918. Russia inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who Catherine decreed could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement, and were excluded from most cities. In France, the French Revolution led to the execution of King Louis XVI. Oh boy. Oh boy, here we are. <laughs> boy, do we know about the revolution and everything that happens. But yeah, I, I do... I am aware of the... There was a lot of anti-Semiticism? Semiticism? I'm not saying the word correctly, but you know... People not being appro approving of the Jewish people in Europe, and I think that was kind of a big thing with Napoleon. He was awfully welcoming and kind towards, you know, the Jewish people in a time where anti-Semiticism, I'm not saying the word correctly, I don't feel like I'm saying the word correctly, but in a time that was very prevalent, you know. Catherine was horrified, and in the last years of her reign, completely turned her back on the liberal idealism of her youth. Three years later. Boy, yeah, like the the French Revolution ain't ain't it just a bloodbath? And I did not know Catherine like was around that long. Like it almost feels like a completely different era, but she was really close to like, you know, the Napoleonic era. Like basically right there in the revolution. Like I did not know she made it that long, dang. But um You know, yeah, like you know, the French are famous for their part in the Enlightenment and some of their philosophers like Voltaire, and then you just see what the revolution produced. Like, yeah, that that, that would be a big, you know, a, a big issue, right? About wanting to, like, turn on it. Catherine died, ending one of the most glorious reigns in Russian history. She was succeeded by her son, Paul, 
a man obsessed by military discipline and detail, and opposed to all his mother's works. Russia joined the coalition of European powers, fighting revolutionary France. Marshal Suvorov, one of Russia's greatest military commanders, won a series of victories against the French in northern Italy. Yeah, so, so I'm not going to even try to say his name. But this man is very famous, obviously, also in the time of the Second Coalition Wars. Um, definitely a force to be reckoned with. I, I've read some of his battles, and yeah. Shame he wasn't around in the later parts of the Napoleonic Wars. He would have... It would have been interesting to see him, you know, like, Third Coalition onward, and just, like... Almost kind of like... It feels weird saying this, but almost kind of like... I, I kind of wish he had actually faced Napoleon. Like, I, I kind of wanted to see what the heck would have happened if, if, you know, he had met Napoleon himself and battled. But, you know, still. Probably, probably a lot of death, obviously, right? But, um, yeah. Yeah, I do know a bit about him. But the wider war was a failure. Meanwhile, Paul's reforms had alienated Russia's army and nobility. Yeah, and Paul gets assassinated. Okay, we're kind of getting to the point where I kind of know a bit of what's going on in Russia, only because of all the crap load of Napoleonic videos we've watched, especially from, like, you know, um, old Britannia. We're finally at a point where I kind of know what's going on <laughs> with Russia. And, um... Yeah, Paul gets assassinated by some of the Russian higher-ups, you know, and then that kind of gives rise to Tsar Alexander. And he was murdered in a palace coup. He was succeeded by his 23-year-old son Alexander, who shared his grandmother Catherine's vision for a more modern Russian state. His advisor, the brilliant Count Mikhail Speransky, reformed administration and finance. Yet the emperor refused to back his plans for a liberal constitution. Ultimately, it was war with France that would dominate Alexander's reign. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Secretly a Napoleonic video in disguise. <laughs> How many Napoleonic videos have we covered? I'm, uh, like, so much, right? <laughs> Man, I feel like... I, I won't call myself an expert by any means, heck no. But I feel like in terms of just amateur, being an amateur history buff, I probably know a bit about the Napoleonic Wars. At least compared to the average person. You know? Like, man, so much. So much about this era. France had a new emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, who inflicted a series of defeats on Russia and her allies at Austerlitz, Eilau, and Friedland. But at Tilsit in 1807, the two young emperors met and made an alliance. Russia attacked Sweden, annexing Finland, which became an autonomous Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire. Mm. But then, in 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia. Yeah. It's just a complete destruction. Like, Tsar Alexander and Napoleon for a bit there were on the same page, or at least, you know, friendly enough, but it's just a complete destruction of that relationship. A lot of it to do with Napoleon's part. Um... It's almost interesting, because after Tilsit, it's almost like Napoleon kind of wanted to carve up all of Europe, but with, you know, Russia, as Russia and France kind of in a weird way dominate the rest of Europe, even having specific f spears of influence, but obviously some of the, some of the promises made weren't upheld, um, the continental system had an effect on the Russian economy, you know, Napoleon, and there was, 
there's just a lot <laughs> to why this relationship fell apart. A lot of it on Napoleon's part of, you know, not keeping this relationship intact. And it's interesting just how much of Napoleon's dominance really did rely on having Russia on his side, right? And having... Which would make you think he would try harder to step up his diplomatic game and be, like, really, like, keep keep Russia on his side, right? But, you know, like I've said before, Napoleon's foreign policy and diplom diplomacy wasn't... I I've said it kind of sucks, but <laughs> in the way he dealt with his allies, his foreign allies, and, um... Yeah obviously, and the infamous that Napoleon, this invasion that we've covered so much, which is what broke Napoleon, you know, and basically led to his complete downfall, this invasion. At Borodino, French and Russian armies clashed in a gigantic battle, one of the bloodiest of the age. Napoleon emerged victorious, but the Russian army escaped intact. Mm -hmm. Napoleon occupied Moscow, which was destroyed by fire. And when Alexander refused to negotiate, the French army was forced to make a long retreat through the Russian winter and was annihilated. Napoleon had been dealt a mortal blow and Russia, alongside Prussia, Austria and Britain, then led the fight back, which ended in the capture of Paris and Napoleon's abdication. At the Congress of Vienna, as part of the spoils of war, Alexander became King of Poland. Then... I can't get over the, the Historia Civilis' telling of the Congress of Vienna, where Tsar Alexander is just acting insane and threatening duels with people <laughs> and just completely off the... completely insane and unhinged. Like, every time I think of the Congress of Vienna, I just think of Tsar Alexander and his antics. But yeah, you know, basically dominate Poland, keep Poland under the thumb, because no one wants Poland back. You know, especially Tsar Alexander, right? They would be a constant threat, so... So, yeah, that that's also kind of a thing that I think contributed to, like, Tsar Alexander and Napoleon's relationship falling apart. The Duchy of Warsaw, which could have been interpreted, right, as, like, a return to Poland to some degree, obviously wasn't received well. And, um... Yeah, I think what's interesting is that Tsar Alexander, I think, was the main guy Napoleon was negotiating with and to get Elba, right? Like, because he, he beelined for France and Paris, and I think he was the first one to arrive there. So, if I remember correctly from Historia Civilis' telling, it's been many months but since I watched that video, but, um, yeah... Tsar Alexander was not an idiot. Like, the man was not dumb. Probably a bit unhinged by the end. A little, a little um, unhinged. But overall, not a dumb man. Like, he actually, like... I would say kind of cunning or shrewd in his own way. All I'd say is that he was not an idiot. And at the end, he got a lot out of it, you know? So... Yeah, kind of underrated, but Tsar Alexander's an interesting guy on his own, right? With Austria and Prussia, he formed the Holy Alliance, with the aim of preventing further revolutions in Europe. Meanwhile, in the Balkans and Caucasus, Russia had been waging intermittent wars against the Ottoman Empire, Persia, mm -hmm. and local tribes. The frontier had been pushed south, to incorporate Bessarabia, Circassia, Chechnya, and much of modern Georgia, Dagestan, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. But the peoples of the Caucasus bitterly resisted Russian rule. Russia's attempt to impose its authority on the region led to the Caucasian War, a brutal conflict fought amongst the mountains and forests that would drag on for nearly 50 years. 
Alexander was succeeded by his brother Nicholas, a conservative and reactionary. But parts of Russian society had now developed an appetite for European-style liberalism, including certain army officers who'd seen other ways of doing things during the Napoleonic Wars. They saw Nicholas as an obstacle, and the new emperor's first challenge would be military revolt. Epic History TV. So yeah, that, that was that was cool. It was kind of cool that we dipped into the Napoleonic era, which obviously we're no stranger here on this channel. We've covered so much about Napoleon and his era, but. Yeah, overall, this was another really interesting video. I had a lot to talk about, and which I really liked. And I'm looking forward to part four, which, you know, you know, and how many parts is this series? Well, we're covering all his Russian videos, so we're going to be here for, for quite a bit. So either way, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, more about Russia in the future. And, um, like I said, like, this is really interesting. Cool seeing about, a bit about Catherine, her mindset about, you know, the Enlightenment and how that played a part in her, some of her rule. You know, cool see learning about the Napoleonic Wars again, <laughs> you know, seeing Alexander, what he accomplished for Russia, and, you know, and, um... Yeah, overall, just it's, it's really cool seeing all this again. So, yeah, guys, I'm going to leave it here for now. I will be seeing you all in the next video. So, until then, bye, everyone.